children in New York will no longer be required to mask up during school starting today. Here's New York Governor Kathy Hochul with that announcement. Given the, the, the decline in our rates, our hospitalization, strong vaccination rates, and the CDC guidance, uh, my friends, the day has come. Today we are going to be announcing that we'll be lifting the statewide mask requirement in schools, and that'll be effective this Wednesday, March 2nd. The West Coast governors are also following suit. Uh, school kids in Oregon, California, and Washington will no longer be required to wear masks starting March 12th, making Hawaii the only state requiring kids to wear masks in school. I guess D.C. is not a state, so we don't count there. The announcement comes after the CDC eased federal mask guidance last week and marks a shift in policy measures more than two years in the making. The executive director at Ultraviolet, Shauna Thomas, and Republican strategist and former chairwoman of the Nevada GOP, Amy Tarkanian, join us now to discuss. Welcome to you both. Good morning. And so, uh, Shauna, what, what, do you, what do you make of the, the fairly quick Democratic moves toward easing some of these restrictions? I was worried that last night you'd have a bunch of Democratic members of Congress who still were kind of masking and social distancing in the chamber, but they seem to have gotten the memo that nobody's really here for that anymore. And so you saw maybe a staffer or two in, in the background doing that. But otherwise, you didn't see a difference between the Republican side and the Democratic side like you did a, a year ago. Do you, do you feel like that's coming organically from the bottom up, where a lot of Democrats are just you know, ready, to, ready for the pandemic to be over? Or do you think that there's some politics involved in this, too, that they're feeling some blowback? Uh, my guess is for for those uh, folks, it's it's a bit of both, right? Um, I think the issue around restrictions or protections, or sort of depending on your point of view, is that this has become obviously sort of more polar and has become more polarized over the last year or so. You know, our nation's response, I think, has been driven less by sort of actual science than political science, and it's been something of a trend to pull back on restrictions as soon as they start working. Um, but <clears throat> I think people generally agree, right? I mean, and I'm talking about leaders as well as the people, their constituents, that it's time for a return for normal. Um, the president, I think, tried to make clear last night that, you know, he feels like we have the tools to fight this now. And people generally agree with that, testing vaccines, antibody treatments. There are other tools like paid sick leave or universal health care, which would be a rational and reasonable response, which he didn't speak to. But in any case, I think, you know, the trend is obviously moving in this direction and and people you know people want to see something like normal with a balance understanding that there are people who are at real, real risk including children amy here in dc we are still going to mask our students while they're in school the city relented and said they don't have to be masked when they're outside of course they're inside for most of school so we're we're holding firm uh, this is like the most stringent mandate still in place, it seems, uh, and, but, which is funny because so in D.C., like last night in the halls of, of Congress, right, all these very old people who are at significant more risk and they're all hugging and they're kissing and they're breathing and they're happy and they're laughing. They're old, old people. Kids still masked in schools. Why? Yeah, it's so sad. And that's that is the question. Why? Why is everything so dumb right now? Everything seems so upside down and inside out. Uh, the fact that these adults get to, you know, re enact with one another like normal human beings, but yet we're forcing our children to still um, have to navigate through wearing these masks and it's hurting them socially, it's hurting hurting them mentally, and they're tired of it. And it's so stupid because you see them in the classroom, you know, anywhere from, you know, 20 to maybe upwards of 40 students in a classroom. And now here in Nevada, they don't have to wear a mask in the classroom, but you're gonna have to wear it if you take the bus. So <laughs> if you're going to if you're going to still be shoulder to shoulder for eight hours a day, but yet that 45 minute ride home, that's where COVID's gonna get you. I mean, it doesn't make any That's sense. So and stupid. even Yeah, it is stupid. And then you go to the airport and, and still, why are right. we being forced to wear it on the planes when still you're in line for TSA? Everyone is right next to each other. No one's social distancing hardly at all anymore. And so I think this whole thing is nonsense. We're done, uh, especially after watching last night. 
with the state of the union, i think that sent a clear message that we are not worried about any more possible variants because we know the flu, it it keeps changing every season, just like covid is going to now change every season. so why why is this all of a sudden the magic opportunity to change the mask mandate? well, i mean, i think the case numbers have collapsed to the point where they're below even when omicron started to rise. so I think there's some sensibility around that. The part, one of the parts that's crazy to me is the West, these West Coast states that are saying they're going to do it on March 12th. Yeah. Like, March 12th? Come on. Like, what? It's March 2nd. <laughs> I, good for Hochul for being like, you know what? We're doing this right away. Like, once you make the decision, just go ahead and do it. Uh, but, Shauna, I'm, I'm curious for w- what your experience has been with, with kids and masking. Because to, to me, a lot of parents and teachers and administrators have kind of confused a, a willingness to wear the mask with being okay with wearing the mask. Like kids, a lot of kids don't really fight it, but that doesn't mean that they're kind of thriving in it. But what, what's your experience been with, you know, yours and people that you know? Yeah, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's true that it's hard to tell the difference. I will say for my, my own kids, they could care less. Um, but they're also really young. They don't, probably remember life right. before COVID in a real way. Um, it's totally normal for them. They have, they've got friendships, relationships, um, and they seem to be learning perfect, like on a perfectly normal and expected sort of, you know, progression. So I, I you know, I, I, I understand everybody's sort of concerns about the mass, lo- you know, long-term, and I, I, I wouldn't push back on that at all, but I do think it's overstated the extent to which masks have been harming children in any real way. Certainly my own experience, I don't see it at all. And that's, an, that's, a, that's a key point though. For, if you're four years old right now, you were two when this started and you basically don't have any memories of a pre-COVID, pre-mask. Sad. I think that's a very sad statement. You know, I I don't want that to be normal. These kids have been brainwashed into thinking that they're going to harm their peers or, or harm their grandparents if they don't wear these masks. I remember my son, who's 12, the very first time he was able to go into a grocery store, he stopped in the doorway. He had to think about it. Am I okay to enter? Mom, am I okay to enter? Can I go back to the car and get my mask? I don't feel like I should be entering. It was like, wow, you know, I've got to unprogram you. You're going to be okay. I, I don't let my kids go to school if they have the sniffles or a cough. I mean, that's common sense. So we know that the masks pr- are supposed to help protect against those who are sick, not protect the healthy right. from, from other healthy individuals. I think we're done with this. Yeah, that's the one adaptation from the pandemic that I'm okay with. We, we power through being ill way too much, like as a society. If you're not feeling yeah. well, don't go to work, don't go to school. If you have to go out when you're, when you're, gen, when you're symptomatic, if you're ill, sure, then I can understand yeah. wearing a mask. Absolutely. That can yeah. be a fine courtesy. You know, be well. Go, just go home, lay in bed. But help people who are not ill, yeah. should not be wearing masks routinely. Yeah, and and Shauna, have you noticed this shift too? So, and one thing that I'm proud of back when I was at the Huffington Post, we, we and Sam Stein and Manitourk, the other kind of uh, people ran that Washington Bureau Institute, what we call basically HuffPost heroes. And you were a HuffPost hero if you were sick and you didn't come in and you worked, <laughs> and you worked from home to try to flip the yeah. script of the, this, this notion that the, the, real, the real courage is in you know, powering through and coming into work. Because when you do have a newsroom of you know, 40 people yeah. working in close quarters, one person you know, showing courage and coming into, coming into work with the sniffles means that for the next four weeks, everybody would be getting sick. Yeah. Uh, and so, so I, I do, do you think that's something that is, is going to catch on finally? That like, you know, it's actually not, you know, it's fine to like work from home like, or, or call in sick. But, you're, but to your earlier point, Tens of millions of people can't do that because they don't have paid sick leave. Yeah, I mean, I think it's both. Look, I think if one of one of the kind of beautiful outcomes of this really tough couple of years is this this sort of reintroduction of the idea of community being <laughs> important, um, that we are all part of a community and our actions have impact on other people. I mean, that's 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 like an incredibly powerful and profound kind of point of view and way to way to think about yourself in the world. Um, I do think, though, that there is, um, I think the eagerness to get back to normal does at times sort of 
um, push aside and, and ignore or disappear the reality of people who are vulnerable, who are immunocompromised. The four-year-old in my, you know, in my my house who's not vaccinated and did get really sick from COVID and still keeps getting sick. For, because apparently his immune system has not recovered, um, which has an impact not just on his health, but our whole family's life. And thank God we have paid leave, not because we're getting sick constantly and need to be out, but because he is. Um, and so, you know, it just it's going to impact, obviously it's going to impact poor people. It's going to impact communities of color far more than, you know, anybody else. They're, they're not being centered in the recovery um, in any real way. And I think, you know, these we are going to see a continued impact on the economy um, and on jobs as these restrictions are pulled back. And that's and that's and and that is going to be particularly true for women of color. And you know, so I, I'm grateful that this like community response is 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 potentially an outcome. And I hope we can continue to think about that as these restrictions are lifted, as these protections for vulnerable communities are lifted, um, and you know, and and try to protect protect people from 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 more harm than is necessary. Mm. Well, Shauna, Amy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And we'll be back with more Rising in just a minute.